We're back. We're ready to roll on the second segment of this conversation around vaccines. There's so many comments that have come through from our viewers and a lot of questions. We're trying to get through as many as we possibly can. So once again, let's just uh, introduce you to uh, Dr. Anvin Pele. He's from the Health Department, Professor Helen Rees from the Health Products Regulatory Authority and Professor Hi. Jeffrey Mpahlele, who is of the South African Medical Research Council. I'm going to start off with um, Professor Rees. Before the break, we I'm not sure if you all still connected. I think we may have um, sort of rejoined the conversation now. So let me, let me come to you because I do know that you are there now, uh, Professor Rees. We've seen some comments coming from um, this one particularly, Bram Moro, saying the comment of the Chief Justice and Tate Mohueng Mohueng makes it a worrying to consider vaccination against COVID-19. Obviously, one can read whatever they want to into what the Chief Justice had to say. He very much so was speaking to freedom of choice. People can choose to have it or not and question it if they want to, as he has. Let's talk to this, the, the, the freedom of choice for South Africans to have a vaccine when it does become available, whether they want to or not, will they be forced to or not? Let's talk to that and let's perhaps linger on the, the, the Chief Justice's comments as well. Well, I think the, the first thing I would say is that, uh, I mean, in, what you've done by putting together the panel today is that you've got the right people to talk about the science. So I think let's, let's take the science and the comments about the science versus freedom of choice, which is a different issue. So I think when we're trying to describe to the, to the population the science of vaccines, it's really important that we get scientists who understand vaccines, who understand programs, who understands the health sector. We're the people that can, can fill everybody in on that. So if we can get that uh, established, then, and I think I really welcome the media's engagement in this. The second thing, though, that you're saying is, is about freedom, freedom of choice. So at the moment, we are not anticipating in South Africa uh, that we are going to insist on people having vaccines uh, uh, to, to try and enforce it. South Africa has a tradition of being very open to vaccines. We have mm. high coverage of our infants. We, we're very willing to immunize our children. Um, uh, influenza vaccine, we're not so good at because it's adults, but nonetheless, we do have a tradition of, of using vaccines. So what we want to do as we introduce this vaccine, and remember that this is going to be different because whichever group we go for, and if we go for healthcare workers first, this will be the first time we're going to be looking at a national program that's going to be really targeting adults. So we're going to have to think about how we do that. Um, and the way that we would want to do it is to actually give people confidence in the vaccine and to explain to people the benefits of receiving that vaccines against any potential risks. Mm -hmm. So that would be the way to do it. And that means that the more information that we get out there, the better. I just want to quiz you on this, though, because you talk about it is the freedom of choice. However, and, and I have read a couple of articles about this, and it's not necessarily just a local issue, but globally as well. You know, there, there, there could be legal, legal implications with regard to this vaccine because we're finding a lot of corporates are working from home. There is the, the talk that um, officers or, or employees might or employers might say to their employees, in order for you to come back, you need to have a vaccine so that the environment is safe. A lot of airlines would insist that you have to have a vaccine before you fly with them. We've seen that from some of the airlines already. Countries saying that they will check uh, your passport before they enter, you enter into a destination to make sure you've had the vaccine. So it's almost in a way, as much as we are free to choose this, how much freedom do we have when these kind of pressures are put onto a population and a global population to in fact have this? Well, I, I just want to remind you that we have already got some of those pressures globally. If, if you, many of you will have traveled uh, to countries where yellow fever is endemic and there you have to have a yellow fever uh, vaccination before the country will allow you to enter and you have a yellow card and that's globally directed. So this wouldn't be the first time that we've seen something like this. Um, but I, I think that we are going to have to, to think quite hard about this. And you're quite right. Airlines might well say that they want oh. to have people immunized. The tourism industry, many countries are saying that they're very reliant on tourism and to make tourists come back, they would want their tourism sector to be immunized. I think the first choice, though, is to give people confidence to do this voluntarily. Um, I, and, and at the moment, there isn't discussion in South Africa 
of actually enforcing this. The same would be true for healthcare workers, and uh, uh, Dr. Pille might want to talk about this, because we also we want to both protect our healthcare workers, um, but we also want to prevent them from um, getting the, the infection and then spreading it to other patients and to colleagues. So th these are some of the things that we're really going to have to think quite hard about. Um, but definitely, definitely, first choice is to give people confidence in having a vaccine and to explain to people the absolute importance of vaccination. If we can't get more than 60% of our population immune to this virus, we're going to continue with transmission. Uh, so we have to be able to get high levels of people eventually immunized uh, so that we do interrupt transmission of the virus. Yeah. And uh, perhaps, Dr. Pele, as you weigh in on that, you know, also bringing in the government perspective and where the thinking is at right now with regard to that question that Leanne posed, um, that, that interface between um, your constitutional right uh, to freedom of choice and, and, and whether you will uh, uh, be weighing that up, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, um, uh, the, the, the vaccination of the majority of the population in order to try and uh, stem the tide here. But I also want to throw in a question from from Pule, who says, uh, good morning. Um, since um, many vaccines have been developed around the world and countries started placing orders, I want to ask, um, in the COVAX scheme, are the vaccines uh, which require recurring uh, takes uh, for one to achieve herd immunity for COVID-19, uh, wh wh where are those? You know, what are those? And um, obviously, speaking of um, herd men, uh, immunity also says uh, between the two types of vaccines uh, which I just mentioned um, which one is the cheapest and also the most effective so Dr. Pele you perhaps uh, have a greater insight into this uh, you know people want to know the COVAX vaccine um, and also its efficacy at this stage uh, thanks for those questions. Uh, let me just weigh in on the point about the constitutionality issues. I think we would always protect the constitutional right of individuals who choose not to have a vaccine. But having uh, uh, made that choice, uh, those individuals also need to protect the right of other individuals who need to be protected in a work environment, for example, and Professor Reese was talking about that. So clearly, while I may have uh, chosen not to take a vaccine, I cannot infringe on the rights of my colleagues and then spread the virus in the workplace uh, as a result of not taking the vaccine. So I think those are some of the, the, the risks that uh, uh, not taking a vaccine bring with it. And clearly, employers may well uh, uh, require their employees to, to have a vaccine if they're coming back to work. There may well be, uh, you know, a family and friends who would be at risk. And uh, um, if you're not taking a vaccine and somebody is at high risk of morbidity or mortality, that would also place those people at risk because you're in frequent contact with them. You could have, for example, I've understood in some countries that insurers are looking to their, those that are insured to, to be vaccinated in order to reduce the extent of their premiums given the, the risk that that may pose. So, so clearly this is a, a much broader than just an issue about constitutional right, but many other ramifications, and Professor Rees spoke about that. In terms of the, the, the costs, at this stage, the COVAX facility has estimated that the cost of a dose would be $10.55. However, that's a, still an estimate, and many of the uh, uh, manufacturers of the vaccines would need to come back to us on exactly what that, that's going to be. Having said that, uh, for example, the Gates Foundation has been very actively working with uh, some of the lower cost vaccine manufacturers to get them to scale up the production and reduce the cost. And uh, there have been reports that, for example, some of the vaccines can be produced for as low as 3 to $5 per dose. If we get that, that'll be really wonderful because uh, then we could you know, expand the, uh, the vaccine programs far more rapidly. Having said that, and I think I made the point earlier, that the vaccine costs are about half or less than half the cost of vaccination programs because the program is much broader and covers many other aspects such as the human resources, storage, logistics, etc., that need to go into the program in order to deliver an effective vaccine to, 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 to South Africa.
And then, um, of course, uh, Professor Mpatlele, um, as Dr. Reese had mentioned earlier, uh, there is, of course, a need to establish confidence in these vaccines. Mm -hmm. And a part of the reason for many of the questions and the mistrust is that we don't actually know what goes into these vaccines. Um, Tiani S. Chauke asks, for example, does the COVID-19 vaccine can uh, contain MRC5 aborted fetus cells? Um, thank you for that question. Um, we definitely know what goes in the vaccines. Um, so uh, all the vaccines uh, have to be evaluated. And, um, and uh, in fact, uh, before you um, construct any vaccine, um, you have to make sure that um, um, you characterize uh, what goes into that uh, vaccine, and uh, not only once, but many times, and you actually show the stability um, of um, if you're working with um, the genetic material of the virus, and uh, you know, show the stability of the genetic material of the virus. If you're working with um, um, a protein, a purified protein, uh, you should show uh, the stability of that protein. So in terms of uh, the manufacturing uh, of the vaccines, uh, definitely, we know what goes into the vaccine vials. And in fact, this is where SAPRA comes in, uh, because um, you heard that uh, they're not only looking at uh, safety and efficacy, uh, but uh, the quality is extremely important. Uh, so quality encompasses many things, including the manufacturing. Uh, so I don't think uh, there should be a concern uh, when it comes to um, the vaccine components, uh, because that is well characterized. Um, there will always be, uh, you know, lack of confidence in vaccines mm. uh, from mm. other quarters. And, um, and, and, and this is not because of COVID-19. Uh, this is because uh, this has been an issue for many decades, um, even with the vaccines uh, that we have been using for many decades. There are still, you know, lack of confidence in those vaccines. Uh, there are people who choose not to get those vaccines. And, um, and, and it's something that we need to deal with. Uh, it requires education uh, from those who are able to communicate. Uh, maybe scientists cannot communicate better. Uh, so you need uh, really experts, you know, uh, to communicate about vaccines, the importance of, the, of uh, getting vaccines. Mm -hmm. And uh, I must say that um, um, when it comes to, um, you know, the people who are making remarks about um, whether we should get the vaccine or not. Uh, maybe another analogy that we can use is the fact that um, we have got, um, you know, regulations now um, emphasizing non-pharmaceutical interventions. And you can see that uh, it's just um, a problem for other people uh, to adhere to these regulations. Mm. So you can, you, 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 you can use this analogy uh, to say that even if we have got a safe and efficacious vaccine, uh, not everybody will line up uh, to get this vaccine. Uh, but as uh, you know, other panelists have indicated, uh, just make sure that um, if you don't get the vaccine, um, then you are not a risk. Uh, to others uh, who need to be protected. Very, very quickly, I know we've got literally two minutes left and, and um, you know, there, there, there are a lot of questions still to ask. Um, who would be first in line to get this? Obviously, we know the elderly, healthcare workers, frontline workers, uh, those are the ones that I think have been highlighted. Um, can children have the vaccine in its current form right now? Are we seeing that happening around the world? Um, and then finally, there are also theorists out there talking about being chipped through this vaccine. Talk to us. I mean, these, these are the real questions that we're getting from people. Uh, I don't know who wants to jump in quickly. Uh, would we, uh, pr uh, Professor Reese, would you like to try your hand at it? I think we've literally got about two minutes left. Yes, first of all, uh, the, the, the initial introductions will probably go to healthcare workers, but as you say, elderly and people with comorbidities would also be looked at, and other frontline workers who are at high risk. But these will be adults. Um, as the vaccines are shown to be effective, those trials will be extending into adolescents and children, and that is beginning to happen. But at the moment, the children wouldn't be. And just remember that children, thank goodness, uh, uh, do not seem to be uh, on mass, uh, badly affected by this virus. So you're really going for the people who've got the highest risk of severe disease first. So that, that would be the, the, uh, the, 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 the child question that uh, you wanted to answer. Anyone want to talk to a chip 
um, <laughs> theory that's doing the round? Are we all going to be chipped through these vaccines? Well, I'm happy to say it, definitely not. Oh, okay. From the regulatory point of view, <laughs> no microchips would ever get through SAPRA. So people must, <laughs> this is nonsense. And I think we have to say very loudly, it's nonsense. These are vaccines and they're vaccines, the same as the vaccines in terms of technology as we've given to our children and have protected our children with for many years. Mm. To people talking about lots of things like it, altering your DNA pattern. I don't know, as you close, uh, you know, to our panel, you know, your closing remarks for us, um, you know, that you want people to take away from this conversation. Uh, let's start with uh, Professor Mpatlil. And 10 seconds each, please. No problem. Um, so um, I think it's important to talk about vaccines, uh, but uh, vaccines are not going to be um, the solution to everything. And uh, we need to make sure that uh, even if the vaccines are available um, next year, um, we still maintain non-pharmaceutical interventions because it's going to be a combination um, of uh, all public health measures uh, to really minimize the spread of the virus. Uh, Dr. Pele? Um, thank you. Yes, I think, look, the, the vaccines are going to be with us uh, in 2021, but the, the, the quantities that will be available are fairly limited as, as it's a global uh, production. So we need to maintain, as Professor Peshlele had said, the non-pharmaceutical interventions because the rollout of mass-scale vaccination is going to take a while. So we need to maintain these non-pharmaceutical interventions. And when vaccines do become available, I think uh, people need to, to, to respond to them positively in order for us to reduce the transmission and the morbidity and mortality that comes with the COVID infection. And 10 seconds, Professor Rees. If we don't have a vaccine, we're going to see wave upon wave of this virus continuing, uh, not just this year and next year, but, but into the future. We absolutely have to get vaccines and we have to get them into countries such as South Africa and the African region as rapidly as we can and scale up as rapidly as we can. And we need to build the community's confidence in the safety and effectiveness of those vaccines. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. I, this, is, this is not going to be the last time. We, there is so much more to talk about. And thank you so very, very much for joining this conversation and to you for uh, sending us your questions, your comments, your views. As we said, this was an open, frank conversation and uh, we just putting the information out there so that you can decide. We've got to go. We've got to run away. Indeed. We'll do it over. again tomorrow. Take care. The